Welcome back to panel four of our Environmental Health and the Law Conference. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I would like to uh, turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Darcy Friedman, who is the director of the Mary Ann Swetland Center for Environmental Health here at Case Western Reserve University, which is one of the co-sponsors of our program. Uh, and so I will uh, turn it over to you, Darcy. Darcy, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Good afternoon. And um, thank you for organizing such a great convening here, even though it is virtual, I think it's content is more relevant than ever. And I, in one of the um, lessons, I think for me in, in, you know, the focus of this convening and in our current time with COVID-19 is the reality that many of the things that we talk about seem very intractable. And I think what we're seeing is it, what can happen when the intractable, intractable becomes tractable. And um, I, that is really the focus of the Marianne Swetland Center for Environmental Health. How do we look at environmental issues and their impact on health, but particularly around um, opportunities for change, or really a solutions-oriented research agenda with our, within our center? Um, our research is very community engaged and um, aligns with a lot of the interests that community members have around the environment. And the topics of this panel around controlling consumer exposures is one that we hear of, to be of great interest among community members. Um, in our presentation today, we're going to be hearing about exposures such as PFAS, substances um, in our food and nanoparticles. And we're gonna be hearing from a great uh, group of panelists. And I'm gonna do a brief introduction of the three panelists and then we'll open it up for them to begin their presentations. Our first presenter is uh, Ms. Montrese McNeil Ransom, who is a senior public health analyst and team lead for public health law training and workforce development with the Public Health Law Program and the Center for State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Ms. Ransom began her career in public health law in 2001 when she was appointed a, uh, to the CDC as a Presidential Management Fellow, and she has continued that career um, uh, in leading things like the CDC's um, annual public health law conference and developing novel partnerships between the CDC and the American Bar Association and the American Health Lawyers Association. Uh, Ms. Ranson earned her law degree from the University of Alabama School of Law and a Master of Public Health from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, which I am also a graduate of that program, so nice to see your representation. Um, she, in 2017, she was a recipient of the American Public Health Association Law Sections Jennifer Robbins Award for Practice of Public Health Law. And in 2019, she was honored by the ABA's Health Law Sections Champion of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, she's a member of the Board of Directors for the American Society for Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Our second presenter is, Ms., or is Professor, Professor Steph Tai, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Professor Tai's scholarly, scholarly research examines the intersections between environmental and health sciences and administrative environmental and food law. These include the consideration of scientific expertise in environmental justice concerns by administrative and judicial systems, as well as the role of scientific dialogues in food systems regulation and private food systems governance. And then our third presenter is uh, Professor Catherine Van Tossel. She's a visiting professor of law at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. She previously served as Dean and Professor of Law at the San Francisco Law School, um, as well as an expert consultant on food and drug law for George or Georgetown University. Um, she is the recipient of the 2013 Faculty Scholar of the Year at the Akron School of Law. Um, at, uh, Professor Von Tossel uh, is the co-chair of the Food and Drug Law Committee of the Administrative Law Section of the American Bar Association. 
Um, Professor Von Tossel is an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health and a BSN and JD from Case Western Reserve University. So we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker. And I think, um, Jonathan, are, are you going to transition that um, to Montrese? All right, we don't hear you, but. Yep, you're all set. Yeah, it's, all, it's transition. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect, I'm sharing my screen now. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, as you'll see, there's another name listed there on the slide along with me. Amanda Moreland is joining us on the phone line. Um, and Amanda is leading our 2019-2020 legal epi work um, in understanding um, enforceable PFAS standards. And so you'll hear from her toward the end of the call. Um, as well. So we've got about 15 minutes and in our time, we're going to try to describe um, PHLP's work um, in uh, PFAS in polyfluoral and perfluoral alkyl substances, collectively known as PFAS. Um, I'm going to talk to you about our work that um, looked across states beginning in 2018 um, and then uh, turn it over to Mandy to provide a bit of an update. So um, before we do any presentation, uh, within CDC's public health law program, we are required to give a disclaimer. And uh, basically it says that I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. We're gonna talk about law stuff. Uh, if you need legal advice, please consult um, someone who is licensed in your jurisdiction. It's also important to note that the contents of this presentation, although cleared, um, do not necessarily represent um, official CDC determination or policy. All right, so uh, how many of you guys have seen uh, I guess by wave of, of hands, for those who I can see on the screen, have seen this map or maps like this from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Okay, yeah, I see some heads nodding. So what, what we've done in the public health law program in the field of legal epi is really try to um, create a scientific way to study the connection between law and health outcomes. Um, so when we look at this map, you can see it exit 189 versus uh, exit 132, there's a 12-year difference in life expectancy in two neighboring counties. When I teach this um, to public health practitioners, I often ask, why do you think that is? And the answers vary. But our, our point really is that question about li why life expectancy might vary so significant, significantly um, in neighboring counties is one that legal epi can help us answer. So legal epidemiology um, investigates how differences in the existence or the enforcement of certain laws might affect health. So for example, Merced County in, in this particular example may have regulations in place about smoking or road safety um, or clean water, or maybe Merced County and Fresno County both have the same set of laws, but maybe there's some differences in the way those laws are being enforced. But ultimately, what Legal Epi aims to look at is to really look at how law can be a factor in the cause, distribution, um, and prevention of disease and injury in a population. At its most basic level, it is indeed legal research, um, but it is not legal practice. Uh, legal practice, from our perspective, is really focused on um, applying the law. Legal epi is focused on studying the law and then evaluating how the language of the law and how it's being enforced can impact health outcomes. So, um, you know, I, I like to point out before we start talking about the, the, the methodology and our findings of this work that uh, legal epidemiology is a transdisciplinary field. Um, it is not just the domain for lawyers. So recognizing that this is an interdisciplinary conference and that it attracts folks from um, a wide variety of public health and environmental public health and environmental law practice. Um, this field of epi cannot happen without scientific insight coupled with legal might. So that's important to point out. So our work um, in legal epi in PFAS began in early 2018. Um, and just to make sure we're all um, have shared language around PFAS, um, they're defined as man-made chemicals that have been used in industry and consumer products 
Um, they've been used worldwide since the 1950s. Um, they were used in nonstick cookware, so think Teflon, um, water repellent clothing, stain resistant fabrics, um, carpets, some cosmetics, um, firefighting foams, and other products um, that are manufactured to resist oil and, and water and grease. And so today, the most prevalent concerns related to PFAS in the environment um, have, have really become concerns about it being found in uh, drinking water. Um, now that is the first concern, but there are um, states, as you'll learn as we move through these slides, that have contemplated um, other exposure pathways, including air, soil, um, fish, milk consumption, uh, even maple syrup. Um, so what we've learned in our work and what made this prime for a 50 state assessment um, or a legal epi project is that PFAS um, is not are not subject to primary drinking water regulations under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and while EPA develops health advisories that address them, um, they're not legally enforceable. And so we wanted to really identify enforceable standards. Um, and it's also important to note that they're not currently among the list of regulated contaminants um, by EPA. So we know that, that fed several federal laws have been used to um, used to use used to regulate PFAS, but most of what we're seeing happen is happening on the state level. And that gave us um, a prime opportunity to do a 50 state assessment. So what did we do? Um, one of the first things we did was we really aimed to kind of define um, the problem. We started with um, uh, environmental scan, a literature review, um, and what we learned is that most companies um, started or stopped manufacturing or importing PFAS um, in the early 2000s, but they persist in the environment and continue to expose us humans in potentially unsafe ways. Um, and I'm careful with my language that we say potentially unsafe um, because we're still learning about the human health impacts. We know that they accumulate in our biological tissues um, but, but we're still learning about what they do to human health. Uh, animal studies have found that uh, animals that are exposed to PFAS um, at, at particularly high levels um, resulted in changes in, in the function of liver, thyroid function, pancreas, and other hormone, hormone levels. So we are definitely um, studying the human health impacts. So our work um, and generally any legal epi study, um, the beginnings of a 50 state assessment kind of look like this. Um, these are the three steps, the three basic steps um, that our team took um, to, to do this work. So the first thing we did, as I mentioned, was conduct a literature review, an environmental scan of PFAS law and policy topics so that we could help identify the, the attributes we may want to look at in the law um, when we started doing our legal research. So our team um, identified laws, including um, statutes and regulations in each of the 50 states. Um, and then we also collected publicly available state policies, which proved um, interesting and important as, as we moved through this work. Um, that allowed us to generate 24 coding questions, so 24 distinct questions to be answered um, by looking at laws on the books um, and, uh, and, and, and publicly accessible policies. Um, and that gave us uh, sort of the scope of which we wanted to study these, these laws. So um, some of the attributes we looked at in the scoping process included um, whether or not um, the words polyfluoral alkyl or perfluoral alkyl actually appeared in the language of the law um, or in the uh, publicly, publicly accessible policy. Um, how many states specifically call them out? What specific types of PFAS are covered? Um, what sources of exposure or environmental exposure pathways were contemplated in the law or policy, and then whether there are limits um, included in the, the language of the law or in the policy, and then whether or not those, those limits, those concentration limits of PFAS are binding or not. So what did we find? This is the good stuff. Um, well, we found that um, we, 46, most states have some laws or policies on the books that um, speak to PFAS. Um, we found that uh, 46 jurisdiction, jurisdictions specifically mention it. 33 of those jurisdictions um, 
expressly put limits on various exposure pathways, as you can see here. We found that eight of those 46 jurisdictions, um, including uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Oregon, um, and Wisconsin, eight of those jurisdictions specifically call out PFAS and again, put numbers on concentration limits for a variety of exposure pathways. Um, of those 33 states, um, 18 referenced EPA drinking water standards, uh, 22 again set um, more, uh, excuse me, set limits more stringent on EPA guidance. Let me back up. What we're talking about here are the 33 jurisdictions that had publicly accessible policies. So this is the language that we found in publicly accessible policies, not in statute or in reg. Um, and so of those 33 states, 18 of those states in their policies referenced EPA drinking water standards. Um, 22 set li limits that were more stringent than the standards that EPA has released. Um, and another eight of those policies um, have, have limits that are written into the standard or into the policy, but they don't specifically reference EPA. Um, we also found, you know, one of the important things, as I mentioned, that we found is that the good stuff was really in state policy, not in statute or regulation. So you see here an example from California. Um, we also found um, that um, language in policy was, was often more restrictive than um, language that EPA um, has released. So here's an example from Massachusetts that includes additional chemical substances um, in addition to uh, PFAS substances. Um, Alabama um, expanded um, potential exposure pathways to include fish consumption. And as you can see here, Vermont has a what may be a uniquely Vermont um, uh, expansion in their policy, um, identifying maple syrup as a potential exposure medium and calling out specific um, concentration limits. New, uh, New Hampshire provides uh, an example of binding standards um, written into law. And so what I want to do now, I've, I've kind of given you a brief overview of what we've done. We are working on a publication as part of the proceedings of this conference to kind of go into a little more detail. Um, but this was really meant to be an ongoing public health surveillance project. And so we brought on a staff attorney um, by the name of Amanda Moreland um, late last year to sort of lead that work. And so I wanted to leave a few minutes for her to provide a quick uh, update um, on what, we, what we're finding in our 2019-2020 policy surveillance work in PFAS. So Mandy, do you have access to unmute your line? Yep, I think, can you hear me? Excellent, loud and clear. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Montrese. So as Montrese said, my name is Amanda Moreland. I am a staff attorney at CDC Public Health Law Program, and I'm specifically on the legal epidemiology team. So one of the areas that I work on is the environmental health law, which is why I picked up with this 2019-2020 study update for PFAS. And Montres is still gonna man the controls here. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So as Montres said earlier, one of the things that we do at PHLP, Public Health Law Program, is this study called Legal Epidemiology. And legal epi is really the scientific study of law as a factor in the cause, distribution, and prevention of disease in a population. So Montrese gave you a nice overview of that earlier, um, but what's important to keep in mind is that there's a lot of different ways that we can design a legal epi study depending on what the goals of our study are. And so here on the screen, you'll see two types of designs that we use commonly on the team. So policy surveillance and a legal assessment. So both of these studies can accomplish different purposes. Um, legal assessments typically are a snapshot in time. So you can answer the question of what is the state of the law at this point today um, or at another point in time. But it, the idea is that it is a cross-sectional data point. And then compare that to a policy surveillance study, which allows us to collect data over a period of time. So can ask the question of how has the law changed over time? Um, and so it allows us to create this longitudinal data set rather than having just one snapshot in time. 
And this is the type of design that we used for the PFAS study. Uh, and it's really good for that because as Montres mentioned earlier, the science around PFAS and the effects that PFAS exposure has on human health has continued to evolve. And so as science evolves, we also know that law can evolve, albeit maybe not as quickly as we sometimes would like, it's changing, right? We can have amendments, we can have things rescinded. Um, and so this policy surveillance study allows us to look at that change over time. We can go to the next slide, please. So this study update uh, involved two primary data, data points um, to create this longitudinal data set. So the first uh, poll of law was in May 2018. And that was done by another research attorney um, who created a search string to pull all of the laws that dealt with PFAS by state. And then that attorney coded for certain legal attributes. And then in September of 2019, we did another poll of laws and we used the same search string and also kept the same um, coding scheme for those legal attributes. And by keeping those factors the same, it allows us to see how the laws have changed between May 2018 and September 2019. So in just a year and a half, we did see some changes. Um, and by keeping those coding questions the same, we're able to analyze those changes in a systematic way. We'll go to the next slide. So the study update is still ongoing, as Montrese mentioned, um, but we can compare some of the high level data at this point. So in 2018, there were 46 jurisdictions that had laws that mentioned PFAS, and then compare that to the 2019 poll, and you can see that there was an, one additional jurisdiction that had laws that mentioned PFAS. But what was interesting was that 27 states um, that had those laws had some sort of law mentioning PFAS, 27 of those states had a change in those laws. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they changed the um, limitation that they set in terms of exposure or um, that they changed something specific to PFAS exposure, but that just means that there had been some sort of amendment to the laws that they had relating to PFAS. And so also as Montrese mentioned at this point, there is no federal legislation that sets um, a blanket guideline for limitations for drinking water um, related to PFAS, but there is proposed legislation. So there's the PFAS Action Act of 2019. And so that's still currently pending in Congress. Um, but one aspect of that is regulating PFAS chemicals in drinking water. So we'll continue to monitor the proposed legislation at the federal level. And like I said, this study update is still ongoing. So we will continue monitoring the state level laws and policies. And we've also started monitoring case law relating to PFAS. And so there's been some interesting updates to that. Um, and we'll continue watching how that plays out in different jurisdictions. And so one thing to just keep in mind as these updates come and as laws change, um, as the science grows, we hope to, to be able to see that the laws and policy um, changes can keep up with that science. So I think we're just about at time. So I will turn it right back over to Montrese. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, and thank you all for your time. Um, I, in closing, I just want to reiterate that this is just a quick overview of um, our work in legal epi focused on PFAS. Um, it is a policy surveillance project that should be ongoing. Um, and we're hopeful to publish our, our findings as we have them in the proceedings for this conference, um, but also on our website if you're interested in more information. Um, and there's our contact information if you'd like to know more about our methodology or the work we do in the public health law program. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Ransom and Ms. Moreland. Um, that was an excellent presentation and I look forward to our conversation and the discussion. I uh, will now go ahead and turn it over to Professor Tai. Nice. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yep. I'm going to do the share. Did that work? Yes, we can see your slides. Perfect. Okay, and I'm also unmuted, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so um, the topic of my study, I've been studying food lately and the private governance of food specifically. Um, and what I'm interested in, what I've been exploring, is these third-party labels of food. So let me go through um, 
wait, now I can't figure out how to move ahead on the slide. Okay, there, I did. Um, so I'm gonna first give an overview on food labeling. Um, then I'll talk about some of the health claims that are associated with various labels. Um, I'll talk about sort of health beliefs that arise from these different claims and then some kind of analysis. And before this seems all kind of, you know, frivolous, I do want to tie this back in um, to some of the stuff that's going on now with regards to consumers' attempts to address um, some of the COVID-19 sort of issues right now. Okay, so what are food labels? You've all seen a bunch of them. Um, there's, you know, American Humane Certified, USDA Organic, Certified Naturally Grown, all of these kinds of things that you see on food. Um, and many of them, you know, sometimes people have these vague associational kind of values with them. And I've seen a range of folks talk about these labels. Some of them think that there's some kind of stronger content to them than what it really means. And I'll talk about some survey, consumer surveys about that later. And then some of people are just totally skeptical about them. The truth is somewhere in between. But my focus is the understanding of what these labels mean with respect to both public health and also individual health and environmental health. Um, so what goes into these food labels? Um, turns out they aren't entirely content free. Um, that is third party labels um, run by having a sort of third party um, set certain kinds of standards. So for instance, with um, American Humane Certified, they have certain kinds of standards for reporting and stuff like that in terms of the treatment of animals. There's also testing services that are sometimes associated with food labels, uh, but not always associated with food labels. That is, um, some more rigorous labels will have, you know, testing for whether or not the users of the label um, actually go through and abide by the various standards. Some of them are self-reporting labels, so they don't have the testing. Some of them involve, many of them involve some kind of certification, that is third party um, label will certify that the user of that label is, um, is abiding by those standards and those testings if possible, if that's part of it. And then there's enforcement, um, which is, um, often relied upon on fraud or trademark claims, depending on the type of label that is. That is, if it's not a third party label and someone and some company is just claiming their food is heart healthy, that goes under fraud, that's fraud claim. The enforcement of whether or not the company is misusing the phrase heart healthy goes to sort of fraud. However, if someone's using an organic, well, organic label is a different thing because that's a federal government program. But if someone's using, say, um, a humane society, um, animal, American humane certified claim, and it's not in fact certified, um, then there's enforcement through trademark claims. That is, the third party labeler can sue and will sue um, the, the fraudulent users or the, um, you know, the unpermissible, impermissible use of that term. Now, for those of us who are more focused on regulatory areas, straight up sort of regular, um, you know, um, regulation, this has some similarities to it. And then it is also its own kind of thing. That is, private governance has some aspects of, you know, public governance. That is, there is a form of enforcement, um, but the enforcement is reliant either upon third party certifier or upon um, either the government or in some cases individuals bringing fraud kind of claims. So it's less of a sort of um, um, straight up sort of command and control regulation. It's more, I guess, closer to regular sort of tort kind of thing. I would call it a hybrid of it. However, there's similar kinds of aspects to, um, to government regulation. That is, in terms of certification, um, a lot of the certification requirements for some types of food labels will require things like the kind of monitoring and report production that say happens in regular sort of EPA kind of things. A power plant has certain kind of reporting requirements, certain kinds of uses of um, technologies to control air pollution. Sometimes this is associated with food labeling. The difference though, again, and I'm trying to sort of compare these two types of um, governance is that with food labeling, there can be a variety of them, right? And it's not necessarily transparent um, to either consumers or just even you know, researchers, what the different labels uh, mean. That is one label can be quite rigorous in terms of testing, standard setting certification, and thus has a more sort of consistent content to that label. 
um, whereas another label might just do rely upon self-reporting. And so, you know, people who study food labels talk about certain ones as more stringent labels versus not stringent labels. Um, okay, so there are a number of food, you know, food labels, and I showed you some that involved, you know, fair trade and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of health claims, there are many health claims related to there. Some of them are specific, not third-party labels, that is, you know, made with organic wheat, um, made with whole grain, all of these kind of examples here. The tendency for these um, is that most of these labels, and actually, I'm going to ask a question. Does this little arrow show up when I do this? It does. Wow, cool. Okay, so um, for many of these labels, this would go to the FDA. That is, the FDA would evaluate it for whether or not it ends up being fraudulent or someone, um, someone could sue for, you know, not having the sort of um, meaning of that. Now, however, certain other labels like non-GMO Project Verify works as a third party label. Um, and so that's a separate kind of label, which is run by a sort of um, the third party certifier that I talked about. Now, to contrast that with the sort of, um, sort of heart healthy kind of claims. Many of the environmental claims um, made by various foods are actually done through certifier system. Let me contrast these two different slides. See the 100% natural uh, milk from cows not treated with RBST. All of these are sort of individualized claims. Again, FDA kind of claims. Environmental claims, however, many of them go through the third party certification process that I talked about earlier. Um, how, again, the sort of rigorousness of each third party certifier is different. Um, and the one of the labels, USDA Organic, is actually a federal program. Um, so all of these have a different kind of um, governance, say, than the sort of pure marketing kind of claims. Now, what does this mean? There's a muddle, like I said, of these different types of claims. There's sort of health claims, there's environmental claims, and then there's some claims that are sort of in between. That is, um, you know, um, sort of um, antibiotics free and stuff like that, where people sometimes buy that label because they're thinking about personal health, and then sometimes people buy foods from that label because they're concerned about sort of environmental health. Now here's where um, I'm going to tie this in a little bit with the current pandemic that's happening. Um, with regards to foods, consumers are definitely interested in food labels. Um, there's been consumer reports um, suggesting that consumers actively seek labels, although they won't necessarily buy, um, you know, a higher price product, depending on the price point, depending on the label, but they will look at it. Um, and they're considered as important, uh, both health labels and environmental labels. Again, um, different consumer reports suggested that um, consumers even if they don't buy on those bases, um, they actually are interested in seeing the content of those labels. However, there's confusion as to the meaning of those labels. Um, that is, when we talk about sort of public health, we think of a certain thing here in this conference. And when we talk about environmental health, we think of another thing. And then when we talk about sort of individual health versus public health, we think of something else. Consumers um, don't necessarily approach things in that divided a manner. Um, for example, um, Pew Research has done studies on consumers buying organic and GMO free. Um, and many of them do so for personal health reasons, even though it's not exactly established um, that there's, for many foods, that there's a personal health benefit to it. However, there are more established um, environmental benefits to it. And again, consumers don't necessarily distinguish those two. There's other kinds of interesting labels that, you know, my paper will go through where consumers are expressing kind of different confusion regarding the meaning of labels. That is, um, consumers buy kosher for health reasons. There are many people who do that. Um, and that suggests that people are taking sort of associational values and attributing them to having some individual health benefit and maybe even some sort of um, public health benefit. I mentioned antibiotics free labels earlier. Um, because, you know, that's another area where um, consumers tend to buy um, antibiotics-free um, sort of products for personal health reasons, thinking that they're going to accidentally be exposed to many antibiotics versus the public health reasons that are actually associated, right, with antibiotics, which is sort of the, um, you know, the concern that antibiotics-resistant um, resistant bacteria will breed. 
Okay, so what does this mean? Um, there, the problem is here that there are few internal incentives for companies to address this conflation of values. Um, there's no government incentive um, because one, um, the FDA doesn't really crack down unless it's very clear that there is some kind of fraud. And I actually think that that's, that's appropriate because we don't want to over police and raise First Amendment issues. Um, however, there's not very much incentive on the market end um, to address this conflation of values either. Um, that is, for example, um, companies benefit often from the way that they can make claims um, and receive a range of benefits from consumers who desire environmental health to consumers who desire personal health or consumers who de desire public health. Um, what this means is, going back to my beginning, um, is that these labels fail to fulfill some of the promises of third party labels for private governance. And again, this is an area I've been writing upon lately um, in terms of changing the behavior of food producers by creating incentives for more healthful or environmentally food, environmental friendly food production by blurring these kinds of ways of addressing them versus you know, actually addressing both of these issues. As I mentioned, fraud claims are um, inadequate and there are few incentives to make trademark claims to address these particular issues, the issues of the conflation of values versus um, the impermissible use of a particular trademark without the certification of an individual um, third party certifier. Now, how does this relate to the conflation of issues right now? Um, you, we can see this in um, what's going on today with, for instance, um, the buying of masks and wearing of masks. Consumers, some consumers at least, are concerned about personal health. Um, whereas, you know, in terms of not, you know, medical grade masks, but just simply covering oneself, um, experts have been suggesting that the main reason to do that is not for individual personal health, but to sort of achieve a greater sort of public health. Um, my suggestion is that what this means is that, um, you know, people who are watchdogs of third party labels um, should more directly address this kind of meaning, right? Um, and this can create a sort of educational kind of benefit um, to the public about how these different types of health um, can work together either for everyone's benefit or be you know, inadequate in certain kinds of areas. Um, and that's my short presentation, thank you. Super, thank you so much. Um, and we'll go ahead and turn to our final presenter, um, Professor Von Tassel. And I hope I'm saying your name correctly. You're doing great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, and can you see my slides? Mm -hmm. We can. Wonderful, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Professors Hoffman and Adler for inviting me to speak with you today, and thank you all for welcoming me and for allowing me to share with you my presentation is nanotechnology, the new asbestos. Just a couple quick side notes before I start. First, I want to point out that nanotechnology holds great promise for use in medicine, for example, to deliver cancer treatments directly to tumors without injuring the, injuring the surrounding tissue. So nanoparticles can deliver good things to intended places, but they can also deliver not so good things to unintended places. Second, the risk to public health from nanotechnology comes from several different types of exposures. Worker exposure from making nanotech products and handling products at the end of their life, environmental exposure from manufacturing or garbage, and consumer exposure to nanotech pro pro products. In this presentation, I'm focusing on consumer exposure to nanotech consumer products. I hope to be able to answer the following questions about nanotechnology for you today. What is it? Where is it? What consumer products contain nanoparticles? What are the health risks associated with exposure to it? How does the FDA regulate it? Will the CDC's early warning and recall system work to prevent an injury epidemic if a nanotech product causes serious injuries? What can a consumer do, if anything, to engage in self-protection? If a consumer is injured, can he or she recover under the tort system? And finally, I will share with you my proposal of how, for how the FDA could regulate nanotech products and products using other innovative technologies that have never been seen before in nature to both protect public health while encouraging innovation. Starting with the first question, what is nanotechnology? According to the National Nanotechnology Initiative, nanoscience is the science and art of manipulating matter at the nanoscale to create new and unique materials and products. But what does that mean and how small is small? 
this cartoon is a good introduction to the concept. To help you visualize just how small we're talking here, let's start with a picture of an ant carrying a microchip that is 1 million nanometers in size. 1 million nanometers is the size of the head of a pen. This virtual robot on the head of a pen is still 500,000 nanometers in size, so this robot is not a nanorobot, it is way too big. One ragweed pollen is 20,000 nanometers. One red blood cell is 2,500 nanometers. Here's a picture of a small virtual robot injecting medications directly into a red blood cell. But this robot is still not a nanorobot. It's too big at 2,500 nanometers in size. And finally, one nanotube is two nanometers. So when we're talking small, we're talking really small. On the other hand, the nanotech product market is huge and is grown daily. Thousands of tons of nanotech products are produced each year. Globally, over $7.3 billion in nanotech manufactured goods are produced yearly. Experts are predicting that the global market in nanotech products will reach $16.8 billion per year by 2022. So where are these nanoparticles being used? Nanoproducts include sporting goods, cell phones, digital cameras, coatings for eyeglasses, paints, stain-resistant clothing, odor-eating socks, and light-emitting diodes used in computers. These kind of products cause less public health concern because most of them contain fixed nanoparticles. In other words, they're contained in a solid matrix. Of more concern, of more health concern to consumers are free nanotech particles, which are particles suspended in liquids that are easily absorbed by the body. Currently, one of the largest categories of products that use nanoparticles in liquid form are cosmetics. Here we can see the common brand of skin cream, Lancome. The most common form of nanoparticle used in cosmetics are fullerenes, commonly called buckyballs. Buckyballs are less than 50 nanometers in size. You can see that they look like hollow soccer, ball, soccer balls. Here's a picture of what buckyballs actually look like. With buckyballs, this cosmetic manufacturer allegedly put skin treatment molecules into the middle of the buckyball. The buckyball is absorbed into the deep layers of your skin and then allegedly releases its cargo at its proper destination. We'll talk about what that destination might actually be in just a few slides. Almost all sunscreens on the market today now use nanoparticles. Older sunscreens use zinc oxide to block the sun's rays. Some of us are old enough to recall how white, pasty, and sticky it was. Now sunscreens contain nano zinc oxide or nano titanium dioxide, making the sunscreen translucent. It applies in a clear, easily spreadable form. Then there are nanoproducts that are marketed for direct ingestion. Dietary supplement manufacturers are jumping onto the nanotech bandwagon in a big way. Sausage was one of the first entries into this category. Now there are over 119 food products that contain nanoparticles. Most recently, some tea manufacturers have switched from traditional paper tea bags to plastic tea bags. Some researchers were curious about what happens when this plastic was exposed to hot water. They were stunned to discover that when these tea bags are used to brew tea, they release 11.6 billion microplastics and 3.1 billion nanoplastic particles into your delicious, pleasing cup of tea. One large area of growth is the use of nanotech packaging for bakery, meat, fruit, and vegetables, and other processed food products. The concern with this packaging is that nanoparticles easily migrate into the food it is covering. Looking at the question of where nanoparticles are, they're also located in your body in steadily increasing amounts. Remember the com most common type of nanoparticle, the buckyball? What happens to those buckyballs after we spread them on our skin when we use moisturizers or inhale them when we share off our cosmetics, shampoos, and creams? Or we ingest them as part of our food or when we lick our lips after we use lipstick glossy with nanoparticles or nanotapstick? What happens to these nanoparticles after they're absorbed by our bodies? The answer is that nanoparticles are highly mobile. Nanoparticles can enter the bloodstream through the lungs, skin, and GI tract. When they're re released into the air, they can enter your brain through your olfactory nerve. They can easily slip unhindered into bone marrow, muscles, the liver, and spleen, and into cells themselves. Once inside their cells, they, blind to cellular they bind to cellular structures, move through the cytoplasm, and lodge in the mitochondria. These tiny particles can cross the blood-brain barrier, and during pregnancy, they can cross the placenta to enter the fetus. And of most concern, they can bioaccumulate. In other words, the amount of nanoparticles in your brain, your lungs, and your cells can build up over time. According to the FDA, should we be worried about all these nanoparticles bioaccumulating in our bodies? No, no worries. Up until just four years ago, the FDA took the position that particle size does not matter. Just four years ago, the FDA's regulatory scheme was based on the presumption of bioequivalence. This meant that if the FDA concluded that the macro particle version of the material is safe, 
and the nanoparticle version was also safe. This meant that the FDA did not require manufacturers to list nano ingredients on labels. But what we now know with scientific certainty is that nano does not just mean smaller. It means fundamentally different. Nanoparticles are different in optical, magnetic, bioaccumulation, toxicity, electrical, chemical, explosiveness, and persistence characteristics. These different properties create unique human health and environmental risks. Why are nanoparticles different? There is one major reason. The laws of classical physics do not apply. The laws of quantum mechanics and quantum chemistry apply to nanotech particles. This means that nanoparticles behave in very different ways than their bulk counterparts. Now we understand the smaller the particle, the more part molecules there are on the surface of the molecule, thus the smaller the molecule, the more bioreactive it is. So now the poison is in the size, not the dose. So the FDA's presumption that nanoparticles are safe if their bulk counterpart is safe was, is no longer scientifically supportable. In the face of mounting criticism in 2014, the FDA finally changed its stance on bioequivalency and issued a position statement acknowledging the unique nature and risks of nanoparticles. So does this mean that the FDA has stepped in to regulate nanotech and consumer products? Unfortunately, no. The FDA has adopted a watch and wait stance in its guidance documents for industry. It points out the unique properties of nanotech particles and invites industry to consult with the FDA before placing a nanotech product on market. Consulting with the FDA before marketing a cosmetic food or dietary supplement is purely voluntary. In my mind, this cartoon accurately reflects the current state of the regulation of nanotech consumer products including cosmetics, food, and dietary supplements. Should we, the consumers, be concerned with the FDA's decision that regulatory protection is not necessary and that it could just watch and wait? Well, almost a decade after the FDA adopted this presumption of bioequivalency and then switched its watch and, to its watch and wait policy, we've also learned more about the health risks associated with exposure to nanoparticles. What scientists understand about, uh, what do scientists understand about the harm that nanoparticles cause? The major concerns that they may cause structural damage to the cells that causes an asbestos-like effect, may cause damage to DNA that may cause cancer, and they may clog phagocytes leading to an HIV-like effect. I'd like to focus for one moment on one form of nanoparticle, the multi-walled carbon nanotube. These are one of the bad boys of nanotech particles. Here's what one actually looks like. It looks very similar to an asbestos fiber, long, needle thin, and spiky. A massive coordinated study by 70 researchers from seven universities in the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health suggested that multi-walled carbon nanotubes not only look like asbestos fibers, they cause the same type of damage to the lungs. Rats that were exposed to these fibers develop lesions that are similar to asbestos and mesothelioma within a short time of exposure. One case study revealed that two women factory workers in China may have won the dubious distinction of being the first human beings known to have been killed from exposure to nanoparticles. Seven previously healthy young women all showed up at the same hospital with an unusual and rapidly progressive lung disease. The doctors were surprised to learn that all seven had worked together in the same very small room in a local factory for five to 12 months prior to onset of illness. The workers sprayed a nanoparticle polyurethane coating on boards and were exposed to the fumes with no breathing mass from 10 to 12 hour, in 10 to 12 hour shifts. All seven of the diseased workers had pleural effusions, pulmonary fibrosis, and granulomas, similar to the physical injuries found in the rat study I just described. All of the workers had similar sized nanoparticles in their chest fluid and lung cells. In spite of the doctor's best interest efforts, all had rapid progression of disease and two quickly died of respiratory failure. Three have long-term progressive lung disease, the health of the others is unknown as they were lost to follow-up. This is what the nanoparticles look like. They were multi-walled carbon nanotubes coated with nanotitanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is normally inert physically, not bioreactive, but the smaller the par particle, the more bioreactive and toxic it becomes. The manufacturer of titanium, the manufacturer of titanium dioxide nanoparticles is a huge industry, producing well over 2 million tons a year. 70% of pigments worldwide contain titanium dioxide nanoparticles. This is because nanopigments are highly light reflective, making the pigments very bright. This makes the, these nanotech particles very popular for use in lipsticks and other cosmetics. And of great concern are tattoo inks that contain nanoparticles that circulate through the body and bioaccumulate in the lymph nodes. So now that the FDA has acknowledged that nanoparticles are not bioequivalent to their bulk equivalent, and the state of the science today is clear that there are increased and potential and serious health risks associated that may be associated with these, some nanoparticles. 
The next question becomes whether this new state of scientific understanding changed the way the FDA regulates nanotechnology. And fortunately, as you may have guessed, because I'm here talking about it, we're still here with very little known regulation of everyday consumer products that use nanotechnology. Why is this the case, you ask? To answer this question, we need to look at what phase of the scientific cycle we're in. The science on health risks normally goes through three phases. Ignorance, when scientists don't know what they don't know. Indeterminacy, when scientists know what they don't know but can plan the scientific experiments necessary to find out. And finally, the state of science will reach a tipping point when the risks are actually quantifiable. Now the FDA has acknowledged that nanoparticles pose health risks, but the state of the science on health risks is still in indeterminance. So the FDA still can't quantify the health risks. In other words, it doesn't have sufficient evidence to make a finding that a particular nanoparticle in a particular quantity or concentration poses a health hazard when used in a particular way to a particular group of people. The good news is that when science is in indeterminance, the scientists know what they don't know and are actively involved in studies to find out the actual health con con consequences of nanoparticles. However, until the FDA has enough data to use classic risk analysis to quantify the risk and label a certain type of nanoparticle hazardous, it can't regulate that type of nanoparticle. This means that until science can quantify it, the FDA's hands are tied. This is a problem that arises repeatedly when the development of an in innovative new technology outpaces the development of the science necessary to identify its health risks. Other examples of when there was a long lag time, long lag time of 30 to 100 years between the introduction of new exposure and the ability to quantify the health risks associated with those exposures include medical x-rays, benzene, lead, and asbestos, to name just a few. When the state of the science is in an ignorance or indeterminacy, public health regulators like the FDA are operating in what I call the space between or in the health risk information void. What does this mean to consumers? According to the FDA, since it's uncertain what the health risks are for consumer exposure to nanoparticles, nanocontent does not render a product unsafe. Therefore, nanocontent is not material, and there's no need to list it as an ingredient on the product label. Consequently, under our current system, the FDA is not able to fill its gatekeeper role and nanoproducts are being introduced into the market at an escalating rate. The question then becomes, will the FDA and the CDC's early warning systems prevent an injury epidemic like what's happening with vaping products? Unfortunately, it's unlikely. First, because nanotech ingredients are not listed on labels, consumers are not aware of new exposures. So consumers and their doctors can't report any new exposure and injury connection to the FDA and CDC and the FDA and CDC can't collect any data on nanotech injuries and the cause of those injuries. The bottom line is that without access to data, the work product recall system has been short-circuited and does not work. So if the government can't act in its role to protect consumers, can the consumer engage in self-protection and simply avoid these products? No, unfortunately, nano ingredients are usually not listed on labels, so consumers can't avoid these products. So if a consumer is injured, that consumer can recover for his injuries or her injuries under the tort system, right? Unfortunately, because the state of the science is in indeterminacy, a plaintiff will have problems establishing both causation and foreseeability. Framing the issue. So as you can see, focusing on the degree of hazard when regulating innovative technologies makes no sense. As this begs the question, is outcome determinative and leads to little to no regulation until the health risk information void is filled or there's a public health crisis like the one we are experiencing with vaping. Cutting this Gordian knot means that we need to paradigm shift on how to view novel ingredients that have never been seen before in nature. Those who argue that there should be ingredient listings based simply on a consumer's right to know have gained little traction, so a different focus is needed. My thought is that we should switch our focus from hazard to novelty. What makes nanotech contact material is its novelty. And a focus on novelty, not hazard, can trigger what I call the public health product safety net. Here's how it works. The FDA requires all material information to be listed on labels already. Based on its novelty, nano content would be material and be required to be listed on labels. This can be accomplished with just these four letters bracketed by these two characters in front of any every nano ingredient included in consumer products. Then if a consumer has an allergic or toxic reaction to a nano ingredient in the product, the consumer can see the nano ingredients listed on the label and see that she's been exposed to a new ingredient. She can then report that she's been exposed to that new ingredient to get proper treatment for injury from the physician, and the doctor can then report the injury to the FDA and the CDC. The FDA and CDC can then start to collect data on the relationship between the novel ingredient and any injuries. 
if the, uh, the large number of injuries, if a number of injuries grows alarmingly large, the CDC or the FDA can initiate a recall before more consumers are injured. This data also supplies the information necessary to establish causation and proximate cause so that the injured consumer can bring a cause of action under the tort system. This allows the tort system to act instrumentally to encourage increased investment in safety, properly pacing, placing the cost of the loss on the least cost avoider, facilitate cost spreading, and the more efficient production and sale of consumer products to further safeguard public health. So my thought is that nanotech content should be considered material based both on novelty and the need to engage the government systems to protect and compensate consumers through the creation of a public health product safety net. My look while you leap strategy allows innovative nanotech consumer products onto the market while building an attract and trace feature if they start causing harm. The creation of this safety net appears to properly balance all the stakeholders' interests by protecting public health while encouraging innovation. Thank you for your time and interest and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, I know that we're, we were supposed to end at 3.05, so I want to get your check in terms of whether we have time for a few questions. Oh, we do. We can go, okay. we start a little late, we can go a little late. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll just start off. I really appreciated the three talks and it made me think about one of the first papers I ever wrote was um, focused on defining public health literacy. And there, there's a lot of the, the premise of that paper was around this idea of individual level health literacy and people under, you know, numeracy and um, general literacy required to be able to understand, for example, a dose uh, or understand risk um, calculations. But a lot of people uh, are not, I mean, even individual level health literacy is difficult for many people if you start to extrapolate that up to a public health literacy, so how do you understand the collective um, effect of anything and the role that my behavior plays on other people, um, even though it might not have a negative effect on me or the people that I care about the most? So in listening to these talks, I, I like this concept of public health literacy came into my mind. And another thing that came into my mind was an experience in one of my first studies, we started a farmer's market in, within a public housing community. And we had the produce all set up, the youth were running the, the farmer's market and people would come up and they would look at the products and they would leave. And like there, there was clearly something wrong with the products. And so we finally asked people, why aren't you buying any of the produce? And somebody said, it's not wrapped in plastic. And there was this view that if you had, uh, you know, if, if it was sanitary and clean, hygienic produce, it would have been wrapped up in plastic to keep the germs out of it. I um, mean, so it sort of raised a question for me across your project is, is how, do, how do we develop policy that takes into account people's varying levels of capacity to understand things like nanoparticles and environmental exposures. And, and then furthermore, when the tools that are developed, like a label, like maybe that's what I'm thinking, is my helper um, to make me, help me make a quick decision, are really not necessarily developed maybe for my interests, um, maybe they're really designed to promote, you know, economic opportunity for whatever, some kind of corporation. So how do we think about the, the um, connection between your projects along this idea of public health literacy? And, you know, what does it mean in terms of risk communication, um, uh, transparency in marketing of risk um, or in promotion of products? And also even in terms of policy development. Um, and you know, even going back to the first presentation, I do a lot of work around food policy and you know, in hearing about all those uh, PFAS policies, I'm just curious, like who's behind that policy development? Is it really being driven by a public health interest or is it being driven by some other kind of interest? Because it, I can say from the public health space, which is really my space, Oftentimes, we're not um, very engaged with, with policy, um, 
you know, experts in that process. So it's always, it almost feels like policy comes out of not public health space. It's coming from other, some other, and in public health, we're trying to either ride the coattail or sort of slowly, um, you know, uh, curve the squid, the um, hard edges. So I'd, I'd love to hear some of your feedback on that. How do we do the order thing? How do we do order? If, if anybody wants to just start, that would be fine. Do you want to start, Professor Tai? Oh, sure. Um, so I actually would love to read your paper. Um, can you send that to me by email yeah. afterwards? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my focus has been on in the latest, in the last few years, has been on studying private governance. So um, I think here, um, there's room for watchdogs. There's a lot of labeling kind of watchdogs that do comparative assessments of how, um, you know, how much all those little metrics that I showed before, um, what kinds of testing is involved, what kind of standards are involved, all of that stuff. And my suggestion is that those watchdogs um, could probably do more in terms of the consumer communication kind of front, not just sort of assume that consumers know what it means when they put out these sort of massive reports, but convey the sort of difference between what public health means, what individual health means, what environmental health means, and how they sort of correlate. So that's I think, my small contribution to this. I don't know on this sort of greater sort of policy level, though. So, so this is Montrese, you know, I, our constituents in the public health law program are state, tribal, local and territorial health departments. And so our focus is on, um, in particularly on my team, has been focused on building the capacity of those folks to really understand the foundation of law as, as the, the thing that allows us to do everyday public health practice and some of the considerations that the basic entry level public health practitioner needs to know and doesn't know. And then, then also focused on building the capacity for them to understand and use law as an interventional tool. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, we always say we're 30,000 feet away from um, that consumer benefiting from the products that we create, but somewhere along the way, um, we hope that the materials we're creating to in, in doing our legal epi work around a lot of different topics are leading to policy change. We don't study that because we can't advocate for the uptake of any law or, or policy. So we stay away from even if, they, if someone tells us, hey, we read your document and we passed the law, we kind of want that conversation to end and we read your document. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that from what we're hearing from folks in the field, there's a piece of what we talk about and the way we talk about it, like law is the be all end all. And I think you know what I've learned to say is we've got to educate, we got to spend a lot of time educating the public before we, we start legislating. Because folks don't understand what we're legislating all the time, just like they can't don't understand what those package labels mean, Professor Ty. Mm -hmm. They depend on us for that. My mother would probably would be one of those folks that said, that's not, you don't need to eat that because it's not <laughs> plastic. There's also one of those folks that says that there's no reason to, to, to give up using aerosol cans if the government hasn't said to give them up. So I think there's, I'm saying a lot there, but, but hopefully that helps a little bit in, in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I wanted to kind of point out is you asked, you know, who's behind the policy change that we're seeing? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that we've thought about looking at maybe taking a segment of the jurisdictions that we have and kind of doing a deep dive in legislative history, kind of seeing who was behind it, maybe seeing if we could find some connections there. Um, but certainly something to think about. That's my, my small contribution to that. Can, can I jump in with just one example, just because I've been following the issue in Wisconsin, but um, the governor actually issued um, some kind of order for the DNR to start working on PFAS regulations. So um, that was directly coming from, um, I guess, well, the governor. <laughs> um, and that was also from a push by people, um, a, some sort of different groundwater activists to address this. 
Um, um, rather, another random thing, when you were talking about case law on PFAS, Montrese, um, one thing that occurred to me is that you might want to look at sort of recent either NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, or SEPA, State Environmental Policy Act lawsuits, because I've been seeing some folks, at least in Wisconsin, try to raise, you know, the failure to fully adequately, like, evaluate, like, say, um, the PFAS sort of impacts of, I think it's like, um, um, military facilities in their sort of EISs. And so that might be an area where it does come up. So any random suggestion? That's super helpful. Um, yeah, we did come up, see a lot of connections with military installations in the early research. Um, uh, Mandy, do you want to respond to that? Are you finding anything in the case law related to NEPA and SEPA? Um, what, what are you finding? If you're- you might be on mute. If not, no, no worries, Darcy. You it can... looks like you are on mute, Amanda, if, if you want to unmute yourself. It's in the bottom left corner of your screen. You'll just un click on that microphone button. We were chatting. I know she had some issues with her, her dog, so she may have stepped away. And now I don't think I see her on there at all. Okay. Hmm. We may have lost her for a minute. So in, in talking about some of this, I, you know, I'm, I'm really loving hearing the panelists and I certainly learned an awful lot from everybody today. So I appreciate it. Uh, and it's an honor to, to be serving on this panel with, with both of you. Um, it is, you know, part of it, we're talking about uh, consumer education is that part of it is um, with nanoparticles and an awful lot of other innovative types of inner ingredients, consumers aren't even aware that their products contain these ingredients, um, and so some of the some of the um, the uh, third-party labeling and and uh, and consumer watchdog efforts um, just haven't started up in this area. So I would say that this is back you know 20 years ago when I first started uh, writing about genetically modified organisms and you know and what we're doing as far as uh, informing consumers about that, we're, we're sort of at that beginning uh, uh, phase. And so um, uh, I would be very interested to hear about what kinds of things that could be done to enhance consumers' awareness of these kinds of, uh, of um, ingredients that include that are in their products. But for me as a, as a public health person, and I think about you know, the environment because we're washing all these things down into, into the water system and it's impacting um, uh, you know, all the, the bacteria that uh, is in our waterways um, is, is putting together a mechanism where we can track and trace instead of living sort of in this, in this cycle where we've got these uh, health risk information points, we've got big data strategies that we could put together where we could um, analyze this data. Um, and so my thought is that we should be collecting it. Uh, and in that way, we'd know we wouldn't be operating in, in, in determinants. We'd know, uh, and we'd know, you know, more in real time uh, whether these products are actually causing um, uh, harm uh, to individuals. And that some of these questions that, that that have been raised could potentially be put to rest and be put to rest quicker. Yeah, and I think that you know, I have two thoughts from from your comments. You know, one of the concerns that I always have from an equity perspective is that you end up, um, you have, you know, definitely in the food system, you see this where you have this tiering of um, the kinds of food that people have access to. So GMO or organic or, or the regular food. And so you really, if, if it really is as bad as we say it is, um, you further exacerbate a, a, you know, disparities within populations because there tends to be a, then it becomes a premium product. There's, it's a higher cost product. Um, I think the, the other thought just around your track and trace, which I really appreciated that in your um, presentation of, you know, kind of giving an opportunity to do something. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering if there, it seems like it could be difficult to get traditional regulatory groups to move that forward. Um, but if there are other, um, you know, more 
like taking advantage of social media and other strategies for collecting a lot of data um, at, you know, like to potentially gather the kinds of information that you would want to start to make a case. But, you know, from a research perspective, it also raises a lot of questions about who's reporting and potential bias in, you know, the, the, um, the groups that are able to share their story. Um, you know, and have the capacity to, to understand, like you said, they don't even know it's in there. So how do you know, start to learn that these products are in it, you know, it goes back to those literacy issues again, like not everybody will learn that at the same time, you know. So Darcy, just real quick on the paper, I need a copy of that too. We're working on a copy. <laughs> Okay, I'll send that out. Um, it's been out. It's in an old paper at this point, but I'll send it to you guys for sure. Somehow I'm sure the principles still ring true. Though. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, I think you see it with um, COVID as well, and you see it with vac. I mean, generally, people have a very hard time understanding public health impact and the other side of public health, and that, you know, even in all three of your examples, what is uh, a meaningful change on the population level is probably a very small change. Um, like I, in the food space, for example, if we had population level reduction of 100 calories on average for everybody, um, we would go back to our 1970s rates of obesity. But that doesn't mean that one person, you know, I might not need to have 100 calories, calories less. I might need 300. Another person needs 300 more calories, but the average, um, but people have a very hard time understanding average um, impact and, and nobody is the average. So the, whatever the results are for the average aren't translatable to any one individual. Um, so it, it's a challenge in public health space overall. Any other questions? Um, and it looks like we do have one chat. Oh, we should probably wrap up from Jonathan. So we can go ahead and we can wrap up here. Um, Jonathan, if you wanna go ahead and uh, take it back over and, and, and wrap up. Sure, thank you, Darcy. Um, uh, again, thanks everyone for participating in this conference. Uh, it was great, I think, to. The interdisciplinary conversation that we've had all day has been been really great and and hearing people talk across disciplines on a wide range of issues that relate to environmental health and hopefully we will be able to do more programs like this uh, personally uh, i would like some of them to be able to be in person um, but i think uh, as an experiment in in a remote conference uh, this has gone well uh, thank you darcy and and thanks to the sweatland center for agreeing to co-sponsor thanks to uh, shorna hoffman and max melman at the law medicine center um, who co-sponsored this as well. Um, the editors of Health Matrix will be publishing the papers. Um, I know most of their work is, is in front of them, but uh, uh, appreciate their, their cooperation with this. Uh, Patty Harbold, uh, it, who is uh, in the Academic Center's office, uh, who's been indispensable in coordinating uh, uh, this program, both when it was going to be a live in-person program, as well as uh, now that it's a remote program, and Martin Raska in AV, uh, who was essential in helping make sure we could deal with the technological side. Uh, thank you all again. Um, and uh, uh, at this point, I can say we are adjourned. Thank you, Jonathan, for an excellent job. Thank you, Sharona, too, and all of the speakers. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for including thank you, everyone for coordinating all this. Yes, great job being agile. It's a new world. <laughs> <laughs>